I will place it in the chat. Here is also the agenda for today. I'm going to give you a very brief explanation on the New European Bauhaus. What do we do in EAT Community New European Bauhaus? And uh, today's call, uh, co create a New European Bauhaus call. Then we have a showcase of two projects that have been successful uh, in the last years with us. So we have Paloma and Alice. And then we'll have a Q&A session. As we say, we gather questions through the chat and we will answer them in this dedicated time. Then my colleagues, Anne Laura and Rebecca, will explain more about uh, what is the procedure to uh, make a successful application through NetSuite. It's a new platform. And please bear with us because, um, you know, new programs always take a, a bit longer than what we used to do. Uh, and then the evaluation process, uh, it's very important you understand how we evaluate so you can uh, do the best um, in your application. Uh, then we have uh, Ellen Gale uh, that will explain tips and tricks on how to write uh, a very engaging proposal. And we finally we will have the last Q&A session and the closing remarks. So. Have you worked on a new European Bauhaus project before? Please um, answer in Sledo. Maria, we can't see the results on the PowerPoint right now, but we currently have 13% of people that have worked on the new European Bauhaus, 86% of people uh, joining us today who haven't worked on new European Bauhaus project before, and 2% that aren't entirely sure what the new European Bauhaus is. Okay, uh, that's good to know because now, well, and then <laughs> maybe for those who know already can answer as well. What are the three European Bauhaus core values? We've got the answers coming in so far. Seems like most people know the right answer, but there seems to be a little bit of confusion as to what the three core values of the new European Bauhaus are. So we've got 30% that thought it was sustainable, innovative and accessible. We've got 60% that believe it's sustainable, beautiful and inclusive. And a couple of votes for the other options as well. OK. Uh, that's interesting because then that leads us to the next uh, slide uh, that I'm explaining. What is the European Bauhaus? Um, I, can I can I go to the next slide? Sorry. Um, okay, here we are. Yes. So basically, the new European Bauhaus was launched by Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, by uh, 2020, late 2021. And the idea was to bring the Green Deal uh, more accessible to citizens, to make it tangible uh, in, on the ground. And how to do that is to place uh, citizens' needs at the core and, and also to uh, bring some quality of experience to it. So cities not only have to be sustainable, they have to be uh, for everyone and created by everyone. And uh, they have to be um, aesthetically pleasant as well. It's interesting because this is the one of the few uh, uh, EU initiatives that includes uh, the word uh, beauty in it. So the motto is, and the three values that we were asking before is uh, sustainable, together, and beautiful. Uh, Bauhaus. Why? Why? Why is? Why does it have this name? Uh, Bauhaus was a design school that started uh, in Germany in the 1930s, and at that time, uh, the Industrial Revolution had already uh, kicked in, and there were a few um, artists, designers, architects that they really wanted to uh, use the potential of uh, the mass production. 
to uh, bring um, arts um, to everyone's life, to make it accessible uh, to everyone, to satisfy the needs of everyone with uh, design objects or uh, new um, new ways of uh, construction, new ways of building uh, housing. Um, so that is uh, why it, it gets the spirit, uh, the, the name uh, of Bauhaus, to, to bring the arts, to merge the arts and the industry and to make it accessible uh, to everyone. So, um, who is in charge uh, formally to deploy that is the GRC, is Joint Research Center, and they have published a NEP compass that you can uh, access here. Uh, maybe, uh, I mean, somebody can put it in the chat, but it is also in our um, guidelines in our uh, website. And the idea of this compass is that it's a guiding framework for uh, anyone that works with a project uh, of a new European Bauhaus. So it describes the, the, the three core values and it traces the path to uh, for a project to become truly net, to become truly new European Bauhaus. So the way of working is through a participatory process, inclusion of all groups of society in co-creation. Uh, is a multi-level uh, of engagement. So basically, um, it's exchange between different groups taking uh, culture and diversity as a central aspect and a transdisciplinary approach. So collaboration between different fields to deliver uh, an integration, uh, an integrated uh, solution. Um, then for the each core value, the NEP Compass uh, defines three levels sets three levels of ambition. So sustainability, the first level would be to uh, repurpose, to rethink uh, services and products to reduce pollution. Then uh, the second level would be to close the loop. Um, so to come from uh, linear uh, processes to circular. And the third level would be to regenerate uh, in a sense that a project could give uh, more back uh, to nature than what already takes uh, when it is uh, implemented. Um, and then uh, the, the, the value of together, the first level would be to be inclusive and affordable for everyone, uh, to consolidate that inclusivity uh, overcoming, overcoming existing uh, segregation uh, would be the second level. And lastly, it would be to transform uh, to to inspire new words, uh, new ways of living uh, through this um, uh, integration, co cooperation, and raising awareness of uh, discrimination. Then the value of uh, beauty, the quality of experience. That's the one that we often uh, see that uh, project owners uh, struggle the most when they uh, when they try to present it, uh, monitor it, uh, quantify it, because, um, yeah, what it is, what does that make reference to? So the first level would be activation of senses and emotions. So um, when we are really uh, grouted, uh, rooted or connected uh, into a place, um, we are not um, looking at our phones um, or in, with our headphones and thinking about something else. We are actively engaging in the context. We are looking around. We are hearing. We are smelling. Maybe we're even tasting. Uh, some food, uh, and then um, that improves our uh, physical and mental well-being. So that's why they also thought that this is a very core value too. So the connection uh, into uh, across contexts reinforces as well the sense of belonging uh, to that uh, particular place. It feels, as I said, more connected to it. And that's an integration of a new cultural and social values. It's, it's the aim to, to have as a lo long lasting effect uh, for the project. Okay, so here is the team. As you know, uh, EAT community is formed by different kicks, and the idea is that we join forces with uh, other kicks that have a specific knowledge on a specific uh, topic. 
So uh, currently, this is led by a climate kick, and we as urban mobility, we are in charge of uh, citizen engaging uh, calls. Uh, my, myself is Maria Marlogat. We have Anlar, Rebecca, Ellen, Natalia, Marianne, and Annalisa, that uh, all of them work uh, very hands-on in helping to uh, define the calls, uh, monitor uh, evaluation processes and uh, monitor the project as they come along. So please, yes, if you have any doubts, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, throughout the two months, you can um, you can contact to any of us. And this is what we do in the EIT community, in European Bauhaus journey. Um, we say it comes all from social demand for change because we base our calls uh, on um four accesses four challenges that they were gathered by uh the grc in the co-design initial phase of a new european bauhaus they what they did is they went into different um uh, cities and rural areas across europe and they gathered the challenges from different social groups and then they categorized it in four accesses so bringing nature back to city, um, activating a sense of belonging, um, prioritizing people and places that need it the most, and the circularity of process or product. So all of our actions, calls, activities are based on that. Therefore, uh, it all emerged from the social demand for change. We do ignite net events. These are kind of um, soft hackathons in a sense that it's they are not targeted to young professionals or um, young students but to the wider community to participate and uh, to ideate together for a couple of days and then those who are awarded um, they can have a possibility to join the grow net program that uh, allows to test that solution in real environment to prototype that solution and then if they even go one step further and decide to create a startup, a company, they could apply uh, to a Catalyze NEP program. This is an acceleration program for a startups that they have the core values of NEP. So we scout around every year and the call launches around every autumn, around October, November. And we look for startups that, um, that, that they work with um, the NEP uh, core values. Today, we are talking about co-create NEP, but last week we did uh, present the Connect NEP call. You can uh, check um, our, um, our websites that you could see the recording there in case you are also interested. And these are two calls that together um, you could also apply to enhance NEP uh, program. The, uh, enhance NEP is about uh, replicating, uh, scaling up uh, a successful Maria, you just accidentally muted yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. When did uh, I lose you? Just just two seconds ago. No problem. Oh, ah, OK. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, so basically through uh, Connect and co-create calls, um, the successful projects can later on um, apply to enhance NET. This is a call to replicate and uh, a scale up projects that had been uh, implemented the year before. Um, OK. So, and here we have uh, both codes, connect and co-create. As I mentioned, connect was explained last week and you can have access to the recording. It's uh, aimed to single entities to um, co-design with, uh, um, with society, with different groups about, uh, again, citizen engagement activities. And it's funded uh, 15,000 and you need to bring 20% uh, of co-funding. Today, we're talking about co-create NEP. And for this one, you need to form a consortia, um, a consortium between um, two and four, where always a city, region or affiliated entity needs to be present. Uh, we call affiliated entities those that have a legal link to a city or a region. And uh, maximum funding uh, for the project that you can get with us is 45,000 and you need to bring a funding rate of 25%. Uh, okay. So yeah, here we have again the code of a Slido. And 
Um, yeah, what we're going to um, select is eight projects. And here is an example on how the co-funding works. So, for instance, total cost of a project of 60,000, you'd receive 45,000 of EAT funding and uh, 15,000 would be of co-funding, which equals 15,000 is 20% of 60,000. If you have a project that the cost of uh, implementing it is higher, for instance, 70,000, you just still get 45,000 of uh, funding from the EIT. It just means that your funding would be bigger than, 20, than the, the required one. Um, so another question is that co-funding can be in different um, cost categories. It doesn't uh, always need to be uh, in terms of goods and services that you actually bring money to uh, buy uh, something. It could be uh, in terms of um, personnel that you bring on the table. As well, uh, doesn't mean that each partner brings the same co-funding. Uh, some uh, studies, for instance, uh, want to bring co-funding more than anyone else, for instance, and that's an option. Um, financial sustainability mechanism, it's uh, a mechanism that the kicks that we have uh, for the kicks uh, to be sustainable through time. And it is not compulsory now, but um, it, there is a question uh, in the application form on how do you see um, the project uh, continuing uh, after the, the grant, what uh, have you envisioned, envisioned to uh, continue? Um, and if you answer that, so maybe you have uh, a plan to use data, maybe you, you think about marketing strategies and so on. If you have a plan to continue beyond uh, the funding, you'd be, um, you'd be assessed there. Uh, with some points. If you don't have any plan, you can still apply for it. It just means that in that particular question, you would, wouldn't get any points. So the main objective is to resolve the challenges uh, faced by cities, uh, peri-urban and rural areas. Uh, I mean, we stress the three these three type of dimensions of cities because not always have to be in big urban areas, we also have uh, rural areas projects, and um, but all of it have to be, all of them have to be uh, focused on improving uh, the public space through co-creation with different social groups. Here uh, are explained the four axes that I commented before that they came directly from the GRC, and we give answer. We all the proposals need to be. Um, answer uh, to at least one of these challenges or even uh, two. Okay, expected outputs and uh, outcomes and outputs. For us, uh, obviously the outputs are the activities that we that you the project does uh, to help achieving the outcomes. So the outcomes that we want to uh, see is either uh, an improved uh, quality of a specific public space by implementing uh, the NEP approach. So, for instance, there is a public space in a, a space in advance, and by uh, bringing a, a project with the NEP approach, it is revitalized and it responds to a challenge uh, faced by the city or rural area, or it improves the public space by complementing uh, the local um, strategy with the NEP approach. So in the call manual, you have a, a list of potential um, uh, strategic documents that you could make reference to, like a farm to fork, uh, some sustainable urban mobility plans, uh, circular economy act, um, and so on. There are many. Uh, that you can make reference to, and you could com combine what the city is already planning to do with a net approach. So it's either of the two that we would like uh, to see through uh, with the implementation of the project. And then the, the um, outputs, what are the activities that you do to achieve that aim is uh, through uh, products and services that could include uh, rapid uh, prototypes um, that, that would serve the citizens' needs. 
or uh, co-design and co-stewardship. And that could be of, uh, of uh, natural-based solutions, urban regeneration in less favorable areas, transformation of public elements towards a circular model. Again, there are several examples of that in the call manual. And of course, all that we aim to um, influence the, the local policy strategy to implement. We like to help this project to implement them and influence them with uh, the NEP approach. Here in the pictures, you see an example of Plataea that was an unused uh, uh, space in Rome that they revitalized. And our city that was in Kerava in Finland, they, um, they thought uh, they actually posed the question of how should be the public space in, in those um, cities, countries where um, where the weather uh, is not very favorable in winter to, to, to hang out outside, what would you do to, to make sure that uh, people are still using that, that public space? And, and this is one of the designs they make uh, and they put some dartboards so, so kids, so mommies can, can sit down or parents and, and kids can, can play to, to throw snowballs into that. And, and there are many others too. So, just to give you a flavor of what could be, be done. Uh, each proposal must address at least two KPIs, and you can pick uh, of any of these KPIs. Uh, so a demonstration of living lab and, uh, and pilot, that could be, is, is one, the target. Uh, a public realm improvement, uh, it's one target. Then, you, or you need to engage a minimum of 50 people uh, in uh, strength and resilience, um, for the reduction of impact change, uh, impact of climate change, sorry. Uh, then we would also have um, jobs created. We have to, to um, target the two events organized to transition towards greater circularity, uh, one activity to reflect that increase public uh, engagement in food system, number of people 50, and then new skills and professions developed in the food sector. One. So you could pick any of these two that uh, suits more uh, your uh, project. And here is a quick timeline. Um, so we, um, as you know, the project um, closes the deadline is uh, in October, but uh, it would not start in uh, until February, and then it would last until uh, December of 2025. We have a midterm review, and, uh, and that you will also have the support of mentors that um, are um, ensuring that you have the most um, impactful approach with the new European Bauhaus there. And at the end, um, throughout these uh, 11 months, um, you have uh, we will have cohort meetings with other projects that uh, have been also uh, awarded. Uh, we will um, provide, we will help you to, to gain visibility through different comps um, activities that we would uh, coordinate with you. And at the end of it, at the end of the year, we will have an in-person gathering um, in Barcelona, usually, but also to be defined. So you could meet everyone uh, that had been involved in the EIT community New European Bauhaus through the year, you know, through the different programs that I explained before, before Catalyze Net, Ignite, Grow, and so on. Okay, so now is the time to see how, how does a co-create a NEP project look like? in practice. And for that, we have invited Paloma to explain their project. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, so, well, our project is called Elders, and our main target group is um, elderly people from rural areas of Masquefa and urban areas of Masquefa. Masquefa is on the outskirts of um, Barcelona, I would say, to simplify it for anyone that isn't um, from here. And basically, our main goal is encouraging active mobility among elderly people. 
um, through citizen engagement and urban elements in the public realm, which encourage walking. Um, as well, integrating these two groups, like now the NIP projects, you need to have two target groups. So we pick two very different elderly groups that don't spend that much time together. And another objective of the project is to integrate them and, and create stronger bonds between them. So how do we how do we do this? Um, first, we had one workshop uh, in which we analyzed the areas um, of Masquefa in terms of walkability. And then we identified walking routes that the elderly people would want to walk. This could be um, routes that might stay set that they could do in a frequent basis, but also routes that they want to analyze instead of uh, in uh, based on walkability, but also public realm. Um, so it was quite interesting. We we um, we went on this walks on the second workshop, and we got the chance to analyze this in the in the place, and then have a workshop to discuss all the findings. Um, one of the tactics that we use is separating them into smaller groups depending on the route and the and the walks, and then afterwards we like joining these groups in order for everybody to know what everybody has been working on um, and to have it be a, a collective effort. And then with all of this analysis information, this diagnosis, we are gonna have a co-design um, uh, workshops in in the second part of the of the project, in which um, master students from IAC, which is an institute, the Institute of Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, and the elderly are gonna co-design these furniture. So the elderly are gonna tell them what they want, and the design master students are gonna come up with the signs and show them to them a few times so they can. Um, say if they like it or if they don't like it. And in the end, we're going to implement these urban elements that have been designed in this participatory way. Um, and we're going to see the effect that it has in the public space. The idea is that this would encourage walking. Um, so not necessarily place of purely of rest, but located in places where it would encourage people to um, to walk more. And we'll analyze the, the use of these urban elements. How has it affected uh, walkability? We're doing surveys every um, every workshop to see how the project is evolving and how the um, also like the habits of, of the people are changing in terms of active mobility um, and that's it thank you very much thank you thanks so much Paloma for giving this a snapshot but very concrete and so people can see what can be a shift um, now we can uh, go to so brotherhood project I think it's uh, Alice here today with us. Yes, can you hear me? Very far away. Okay, let's try to. And what about now? In better? a bit better. Okay. Uh, yes, so the project uh, is a sort of, uh, the name of the project is a sort of game uh, between the name of the district, that is Sobrero, and Brotherhood, the aim of the project, uh, is to uh, boost the sense of belonging. Uh, can I move on the slides? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, can you do it right from my computer? Yeah, I think you can take control if you see it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, the, the aim of the project is to activate a self-sustainable and socio-economic ecosystem um, in engaging the elderly people and community um, and the students uh, of uh, the schools of the surroundings um, and uh, to use a public space uh, for, for them. Uh, so the scope uh, of the project um, uh, works with um, biophilic design and uh, the NAB values uh, as we want to build a sense of belonging uh, between the community and uh, we want uh, them to have the sustainability and the regenerative mechanism to transform the public space and of course we want uh, a beauty space for them to live in. Um, the, um, the outcome uh, will be um, um, 
um, how can I say, um, a reinvent um, of this public space. Uh, um, uh, we're trying to build the relationship between the elderly people and uh, the students. And we uh, also want to create the opportunities for new green jobs to, uh, to grow uh, in, the, in, the, in this district. Uh, we want to also uh, be as inclusive as possible. So the innovative part is to um, keep also the nature in. Uh, so we want to uh, create this relationship between the people that are living and the nature itself. So we choose this area, it's a rooftop, um, and we will work on this area to uh, build some natural elements and um, we want the students and the elderly uh, work on. Um, so uh, we guide this um, uh, students and these people in general uh, with biophilic design um, and uh, we want them to incorporate and these elements of the biophilic design so natural elements, color, water, air, uh, community and uh, we want them to sense the community. Uh, and the first step uh, is to involve the students uh, and they already prepared um, uh, a day dedicated to biophilia and biophilic design. Uh, they um, let the students work and plant some plants, um, they play, they go outside of schools, um, try to reconnect students and people with nature and the, the neighborhood. And also uh, the different um, subjects uh, of the school try to implement these biophilic uh, elements into uh, this day. And yeah, these are some examples of uh, children play outside with nature and take some sketch uh, as well. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much. Here it is, obrigado. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, of course, uh, if any of you uh, later on wants to um, catch up or have a longer interaction with our project owners, uh, reach out to us and we can facilitate uh, their contacts uh, or, or you can see them in here. You got them now. Uh, how well are you following the information presented so far? I mean, please. Tell us, we want to know about it. How are, how are we doing so far? So I'm happy speak. to report we have 65% yeah. of people that are saying it's all clear. Uh, a lot of people that are saying it's a lot of information, but it makes sense. Um, just a reminder, we have a Q&A straight after, straight after this to uh, address some of the main questions on the Teams chat. Um, some people already knew a lot of this from the call manual. Yes. And we have 2% of people that are overwhelmed and confused. We know that this is quite uh, a lot of information <laughs> and that it can be quite yeah overwhelming. So we're here to um, try and make this as accessible and palatable as possible for you. Absolutely. And again, this is this is being recorded. So whenever uh, it is in our website, you can go back to it and uh, probably the second time it will not be as much uh, overwhelming. Uh, in now we enter the Q&A uh, session. Um, I think I have a question here. Can an entity apply for funding simultaneously from co-create and connect using a similar plant? Uh, the difference to one to another is that co-create uh, includes uh, place making. Um, I mean, there is no restriction formally in the calls that whether you apply for one, uh, it um, it rules out uh, to get funding from the other. However, we do uh, receive um, or we tend to receive uh, quite a bit uh, number of applications and uh, we we see 
that uh, that it shouldn't be the same uh, proposal uh, slightly extended, uh, meaning like an entity can apply to both calls. But I think the proposal should be uh, different to one to another. Uh, otherwise, the competition you make to distinguish yourself among others are, um, you know, are, you're putting the X uh, in one basket. So it's better to distinguish one to the other. Yeah. Um, again, um, I don't know, Rebecca, if you want to pass me another question or, or Anlar. Uh, yes, there is this question about uh, actually about the mental health. Maybe you can read it on the chat, Maria. Oh yeah, that one, have yes. it written on the chat. Yes. Sure. Uh, what's the role and significance of mental health, personal development, living a mindful life in sync with oneself, others, and the nature under uh, under the Bauhaus project? Okay, uh, that's an interesting one because um, he, from the beginning, um, the philosophy of the Bauhaus is um, the, the motto, the, the values is uh, sustainable, uh, together and beautiful. So uh, we have different policies, plans like a Green Deal that looks for six, the sustainability of a city. But, uh, or urban area, but this one that talks about inclusion and, and quality of experience, this is, uh, this is very unique in a EU project that talks about quality of experience. And of course, if you, um, it, the way it links the, this quality of, um, of experience is to, um, is to activate senses, to be connected into the, into the place, to uh, boost, boosting the sense of belonging and all that, uh, that there is already um, proof that um, increases the, the, the mental and, and physical health uh, and the well-being of an individual. I mean, that's why they, they put the focus on that, not just because it looks nice, it's just because it makes people uh, feel better at uh, all levels. So that is how I see it. It is um, connected. OK. Uh, what what could be the next one? Yeah, <laughs> I think we. Can, I think maybe we can move on because we're replying already quite a lot on the chat. Okay. Uh, there I, is there one some... that I spotted was missed, by the way, um, which was a question okay. from Kim on how we define public space. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, we define public space as uh, an open a space that anyone could enter without any restriction of uh, uh, of time of the day, time of the year. Um, of accessible, uh, physical, physically accessible to everyone. Uh, so no gates, no difference. Uh, so free to enter and use um, any time of the year to anyone. So uh, any other questions? So don't worry because we are collecting uh, all the questions through the chat. And we will uh, publish a Q&A in a few days as well, um, in case we missed any uh, of the questions now. We are yeah, a bit um, behind. So I don't know if we should if move you... forward or, yeah. Yeah, I think we can move on, move on because we are a little bit late. In any case, uh, we are still receiving questions. So Maria or other colleagues, you can reply them on the chat directly. Absolutely. And at the end of the presentation, if we have still a bit of time, we can also take them aloud, okay? Uh, great, so I'm going to take control. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to focus right now on the call calendar, starting with some dates about the timeline. So you have a free, you have actually uh, accessible information and how to organize yourself until the day of the deadline. So the, the call was launched on the 4th of July. Today we, we are having the info session. Uh, the, the, we're going to have so the emphasis actually to know more about the call, the rules, the requirement, etc. In September the 10th, we're going to have a matchmaking session and we'll share the link in this uh, today as well, if you're uh, interested in this session. And the deadline of this call is the 10th of October. So this really means that uh, after the 10th of October at 5 in the afternoon, it's it's uh, it's going to be the, the, the platform will be closed and it will be um, 
no longer possible to submit proposals. So it's very important that you keep in mind not only the date, the day, but also the time, because after if you submit one minute after the time, it's it's too late for you already. The, we're going to go through after the submission into the eligibility and admissibility check to check that your consortium and your individual organization are eligible uh, to this call during October. Then we go through the quality evaluation, October, November. December is going to be communication of results, more or less mid-December or just before Christmas, most likely. And um, you're going to have December and especially January to go through the conditions clearing for those selected proposal in order to start on the 1st of February as planned. Um, moving on with actually what to do and if you're interested in applying, what are the first steps to do? So the very first things you have to do is to have to get a PIC number. This is a participate participant identification code. This is basically a code that the European Commission is giving you to participate in any European uh, program. So not only to the NEP, but also to any other other uh, year funding program. So this means that if you already have a PIC number because you already apply to another call, European call, you don't need to register again. You just need to keep your PIC code and go to the following steps. If you don't know or if you don't remember your P code, or you don't remember, you also click on the link. You can also go to the guidelines for applicants. It's written where you have a link where you can also, you can always check if your uh, organization has a pick already and what is it. Step number two is the PIF, Partner Information Forum. And this is in our, uh, in, in our platform. So if you are a new organization, meaning you never apply to any NEP call before, any EIT community NEP before, call before, uh, and any EIT or mobility call before. This means you never register in our um, in our private platform, which was the name is Plaza. In this case, uh, you are new and you need to submit your uh, PIF, clicking on the link, which uh, you can see here. If on the contrary, you already apply, you also even uh, been selected before, you just need to contact the service desk. And they would give you access to the uh, directly with credential to the net, to the platform, which is step number three. Okay, so by accessing this uh, the, the platform, of course, you can start drafting your proposal. But before that, uh, if you miss step step number two, of course, you you will never be access to the platform, and this is very crucial. So you go you can go to it. You can look into the guidelines. It's very well explained. Um, and if you have any doubt, of course, we are here to help you. I'm going to show you right now a, li a live example on actually how to submit a proposal. So just a second. OK, so now you should actually see on the first uh, on the first page here, the PIF. This is just for you to see for new organization how the PIF looks like. Can you see it well? Yes, I think so. Um, so this is the basic information about your organization. So what we have actually have to to have here, the first thing is the PIC, the, the, the PIC number, the nine uh, digit participant code uh, that uh, the European Commission is giving to you through the other platform. So you put it here, then the organization name, the legal name, your email address, website, the legal, con the legal uh, um, contract address, your type of organization, non-profit, profit, um, the NACE code, this is basically a bit to, 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 to put you in, in some categories, also uh, provided uh, asked by the European Commission, the, some finance information as well, and at the end, the primary contact. This will be actually, and, and other contact details, your primary contact will actually be the ones uh, having access to the to the application form and drafting the application form. So whenever it's done and you have all the mandatory field um, completed, you submit and then our service desk will continue uh, the work and we validate that. After that, so you complete this, you have access to the NetSuite, you enter with your credential and this is what you're gonna see. So you have a very simple, let's say, um, screenshot. Uh, um, you can see a, a very simple platform when you see different information uh, at the top. If you go click on menu, you go into the call for proposals, you open calls and you see the list of uh, currently uh, call for proposal open. 
And you, what you have to do basically is just to select which one you would like to apply. In this case, of course, is co-create. OK, you click on, on this. You can also here see a short description, the link, the call URL, so uh, with all the call documents and everything related, and when the call is launched and when it's actually uh, closed. What I'm going to do is just to try here right now. You will see there is sometimes a delay of seconds of more or less seven seconds. It's it's normal. Just be, this is how the system is designed. You just need to to just need to wait actually until this the time is over. And here we are. You have different information over there. Just to make sure, of course, you are applying to the to the uh, to the correct call because here we are talking about co-create. We have also connect call. So really make sure you are applying to to the correct uh, program. The opening date when the call is closing and the status it's going to be in progress whenever you start drafting your proposal when you do the submission is going to be submitted we start with the main information your id proposal will be automatically generated and you will see it here only after you do the save it as a draft um, before that you, you won't see it anything so you start with addressing the main challenges so what your project is about and which challenge actually your project address so i'm taking one randomly if your proposal actually address more than one challenge you have the option to address the second one in this case you can do it or not it really depends on the scope of your project you select the outcome also all this information is on the call manual so you can read it uh, because you have we have an extended explanation and the output the same the same you select from the drop down list you put actually a project title here, which define uh, the title description of your title, an acronym, which is shorter, and then the start and date of your project, which you also can see on the on the call manual. It's going to be the first of February until the end of December, twenty twenty five. This is going to be um, shown only after the budget is completed. Executive summary, it's going to be a short description of your project. What is it? Is it about a very high level overview that we will use for dissemination purposes that we share with the public? So just make sure it doesn't contain any uh, confidential information and you continue with the keywords. So I'm going to take randomly like three. It's the minimum. The maximum is five and you can see it's very easy. You can remove them very easily, add another one and you can do the same with the keywords. So it's going to be random also. I mean, not random, of course. In this case, you need to describe what fit best with your projects. But you can see that just typing and uh, push, uh, clicking on the on the Enter button, it's, uh, it is displayed. So minimum of three, maximum of five, and I'm going to save as a draft. So there is no an automatic save in the system. So it's very important that you save your changes very often and very often. And you can see changes saved here. We're going to we're going to wait a few seconds and then you can see everything is in the system. OK, so this is what we have right now um, as a partner information. That's the second tab. We go through the description of who is involved as a partner, as an organization in the project. So automatically, we're going to see, remember when we create it, we, com we, we complete the PIF. What, we got, what we've done actually is to, um, to use the project leader, so the name of the main contact person who is drafting as a main contact person and has a project leader. So this is actually the project leader, the one is coordinating the consortium, is the one who creates the proposal and will be displayed over here. Um, if maybe I, I haven't seen that, but if you are um, in an old organization, so we know we've been a partner with us or you've already participated, your PIF, which in our system from Plaza will be automatically put it in the PIF, uh, in the new PIF in, in NetSuite. But of course, if you have changed some information, especially your legal status or any major information, let us know uh, through the service desk anyway, because uh, we need to change this before we uh, go into the application form and the pr your proposal is submitted. Otherwise, we will use this previous information to do the assessment. So um, you remember we have minimum of two, maximum of four partners in this call. So 
let's imagine we have two. We have already the, um, the lead panel with, yeah, who is automatically already in the system. What you need to put as a panel description is actually the expertise and the skills to actually carry out the project. And by adding a second one, I'm taking one randomly, just as a test, you will see by putting the peak number, so it's very important that here you don't have to put the legal name, you can't actually. It's not the legal name or an acronym, it's really the peak number here. So nine digital, you put the link and automatically after the organization is already in the system, uh, you could actually recognize it and click here and you do the same. Okay. Um, what is important is also to understand if there is any affiliation, um, any direct link between two participants, because imagine if these two organizations come from actually the same company or the same legal organization, there is this um, control, legal control, but also financial control between them. They are not organized as independent. And in this case, we need actually so in this case, we're going to see is yes, you describe the link, but remember that as a requirement, the call um, um, foreseen a minimum of two independent. So in this case, you need to have a third partner in order to be eligible. If this is not the case and not, no link, you just remove no, and that's it. You can also have the possibility to have co-editors, um, meaning that other participants from your other person from your organization or from, or from the consortium organization can access the proposal. This is useful when you need to, to work uh, simultaneously, but this is also dangerous just because if at the same time you are working and saving changes, maybe this can overread on the changes you are making. The submission is also very uh, a tricky and a, a very important step, so we always recommend to give all of course, access to trust people and to avoid as much as you can having too many people doing things at the same time. And the submission needs to be done by the project leader. So we save as a draft. We continue with the project scope where actually you're going to have all the questions listed about your project. So it's going to be really a description, a narrative about what your proposal is about, what are the objective, and uh, and so on. So we start with the main objectives and we go on with the excellence, the impact and the implementation. If you look at the core manual and we will see our colleagues will explain you in a second. These are the questions that are also um, um, included in a section five of the core manual when we go through the evaluation of the criteria. These questions will be assessed by the evaluators, right? So you really need to understand that they will Evaluator, we look into your responses here, how you complete and how you address each of the single, each section, each question, and they will need to understand exactly if this uh, is in line with the call, with the requirement, if uh, this is really fit with what we are looking for. Okay, I'm not going to go into the details because it will be addressed, but you see it's very straightforward. You always have the maximum here of character and Passing the, the maximum, uh, you, you will see you are not able to read, to, to, to write uh, anything else. What maybe is very important here uh, is that because it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of information, is that you actually uh, maybe work offline. You have also the questions on the guidelines for applicants. You work offline or you save very regularly, as I said, because the system otherwise might be a little bit blocked or so you work off life maybe and then you copy paste everything you have under the section. Finally, under the um, the risk, you also have the risk that you need to address, yes. identifying um, what are actually the risk and you very, uh, you, sorry, I go back to the process scope, which is the final table over here you add. So the, the, the category of your risk, the um, the level, what is the level of your risk, the impact description and the mitigation measure. You save and you can add as many as you wish, of course, considering the scope of your project. Um, and ethics, if this is the case, I don't think so, but in any case, if you have some ethics or, um, or security measure to, to declare, you can select from there and uh, you can have a, a short explanation of it. Then I move on with the work plan. Sorry, it's maybe a little bit quick, but um, you will see it's very straightforward. 
the work plan is actually divided by work packages. A work package is actually a summary, an aggregation of your activities, a description of your activities. And it can be it can be put everything together in one work package or divided between several work packages, depending on also the scope of your project. Um, of course, for this type of, of, of scope of our of call for proposals, we don't expect a lot of work packages actually. Um, but you can decide based on so on or your exper ex experience in scope of your project. So you start with adding a new work package, work package name here, a description, a start end date. Imagine it's going to be for the same duration of your project. Okay, you select who is the the work package leader and the contributor. Okay, so you also need to put as a contributor the leader as well. And imagine the second panel is also involved, you, you put it here and you, you a short explanation of the world of, um, of the partners. You save it. It's going to take a few seconds. And only after expl uh, the explanation of your work package, which by the way, you also need to explain the tasks within your work package. But as I said, it's very well explained in the, in the guidelines. So only after adding your work package, you can add deliverables, not before. So you add a deliverable and remember that we have the mandatory of at least two mandatory deliverables um, from the call manual. So you look at it and you actually put uh, at least this one. You can slightly have, you can have a few more, but it's really uh, not necessarily, it's really up to you. If you have a second work package, you will actually go and add a new work package if that's the case uh, and maybe a third one if you need it. Then you continue with the output. So you do the same, the number, the name, the description, the achievement date, which also, by the way, it's also de described in the call manual. And you do the same with the milestones. With the KPIs, actually, this is uh, a little bit different in the sense that all the KPIs are automatically listed from the call manual. So they are all there. And what you actually need to do is actually to decide, yes, I want to contribute and I'm contributing to this KPI and I'm putting um, the explanation of what I'm going to do, the target value 2025, when I will be achieving this. So it's most likely at the end of the, because you need to decide only one date. So it's going to be at the end of the project and who is contributing to, as I said, I mean, you can select the two partners, if that's the case. However, if you say, I'm not contributed to this uh, second one, public realm improvement, because it's not applied to my project. I'm giving an example, of course. In this case, you need to mention not applicable, and you put as a mandatory value zero, random date, because we are not counting it, but the system asks you to complete it anyway. So unfortunately, you need to put a date, you need to put a responsible partner, a contributor, but because we know it's not applicable and zero, uh, this is not a KPI you are contributed to. Okay, and then you continue with the rest. Of course, by using this button, delete, will don't uh, actually, we don't work. You will see it will disappear, but whenever you will do the submission, it will prevent you to do the submission. It will be blocked and you will need to complete it. Okay, so, this is very important that you do the work package before because then this will give you um, the it will be displayed in the budget because the budget is organized per work package. So I'm going to move forward. The budget, the supporting documents, it's also a tab. You will see in the guidelines very well explained. Basically, you if applicable, you need to put the registration document or the declaration of affiliation using the template um, uploading here. And you see it's going to be document upload. If that's the case, we need it as a mandatory document. And the project gun chart, it's an option. It's completely not a mandatory document. But if you want, as an Excel, you can also upload it here. And the budget, finally, I'm moving a, a bit uh, uh, faster. The budget summary, it's going to be, of course, automatically fill in whenever you complete your uh, partner budget. So you see we have two partner, customer B, we have another one here. And because we have created only one work package, we'd see only one work package here. And because also this partner contributed to this work package, we, we see uh, work package one displayed here. So what you just need to do is, of course, to put the number under 
the different cost categories that we follow Horizon Europe project uh, program in terms of cost. So you also have an explanation of this eligibility of expenditure explanation cost and employees, subcontracting travel and so on. So you put a uh, the total amount, you put a description here. It's also ma mandatory, otherwise you won't be able to submit. Imagine, and sorry, you continue with the EAT funding. So I'm, I'm, I'm going very fast and very, uh, very simple budget, but imagine you actually have here EAT funding. So it's 25% of as a co-funding as a project level. But imagine this partner is actually contributed to the 25. So in, this means as EAT funding is gonna, it's gonna be, it's gonna receive 85%, uh, percent, 25 as a, as a, as a co-funding. For co-funding, we just need to know a percentage. And we also need to know where this co-funding comes from. Is it from private, national, non-EF funding? It's a little bit, it's of course up to you. And we do the same with the other partner. We probably, and this one, is, they're gonna have travel and we need to do here also, need to have a short description and the same. So for instance, this one, wanna have, uh, for instance, 70, 70, because they are increasing their co-funding, for instance, that's also possible. At the end, the 25% is across the, pro the, the project. So I'm adding this and I'm saving. So we need a, a description quite, I mean, not extensive, but at least we need really to understand what the employees, what they will do, how many PFT, uh, PFT they're gonna use, the travel, how many travel to do to go where. Subcontracting most likely, we also need to understand what the cost of the subcontracting are about and to do what, et cetera. When you are done and everything is, is checked uh, and you've checked that all the mandate, all the information is saved, is in English, et cetera, et cetera, you will be able to do this the submission okay you will click on this button over here over here and then the status of your proposal will turn to be submitted what is very very important is that you need you before doing your submission um check because when it's done it's over you won't be able to edit your proposal uh, after the submission it's only one submission and that's it so i'm finished with that i'm i'm very quickly going back to the presentation Thanks so much, Anwar. <laughs> Try to be very fast, but it's it's also not easy. Very just, we have some explanation about the, the process, uh, but I can also go very, very fast. Sorry, yeah, just. Yes, it's here. So actually here is just some type, some actually um, some tips you can read it. Guidelines for applicant is available. Register organization as soon as possible. Don't wait until the end because otherwise you, we won't be able to assess you in case you have technical issues. So submit at least ideally one day before the deadline and you can contact PMO in case you have any doubt for the application form itself. As an evaluation and selection process, so our call works always in, this, as, in the same way. So we start with eligibility and admissibility. Check these other criteria. I'm not repeating because Maria already explained. Uh, but you really need to make sure that you fit, of course, in all these criteria. Quality evaluation. This is going to be after your proposal passed and is eligible. We will send them to the quality evaluation, a pool of experts that will go through different criteria, starting with, with excellence, then impact and implementation. And they will produce a summary evaluation report, uh, give up to 70 points. To what? It's a consensus, of course. It's a it's a common score and comments, and um, Rebecca will actually uh, explain you a little bit more in depth uh, what these criteria are about. Exactly. So I'm just going to take control there. Thank you, Anwar. Um, so very quickly to run through this, I'll try to be as concise as possible to leave time for uh, the Q and A. So as Anwar has already mentioned, proposals will be evaluated across these three evaluation criteria. Okay, excellent in excellence, impact and implementation uh, with a total of 70 points. So any um, any proposals that reach 45 points or lower will not be eligible to receive uh, funding. They will be disqualified. So beyond the application form and the questions that Anne Lore has just walked you through, we will also provide you, and it's currently available in the call manual, 
with the grading criteria that will be used to evaluate your proposals. This is exactly the grading rubric that will be used to evaluate your proposals. So I suggest that you write your proposals with this in hand. Uh, we designed the application form so that each question aligns with the grading criteria. So this is both easier for you as applicant and easier for our evaluators. It's very clear what we're asking for. <clears throat> but despite this, we ask you to be very thorough in how you read these questions and to identify the key elements. So, for example, here in the first criteria, we ask for the project objectives. But not just this, we ask that the objectives are smart and that they are in line with the NEB challenges. If you fail to address one of these elements, there is a limit in how many points we can give you. So, for example, your answer could be um, very well written, but if you fail to provide smart objectives, you may be limited to a maximum of three or four points for this criteria point. OK, so uh, beyond this, each criteria point will be scored out of five. And you can see here on the side um, a very uh, vague uh, kind of overview of what one, two, three, four and five points are. So I have kind of circled a couple of the key elements for each criteria point. I suggest that you do the same as you're answering each question. Uh, so here in the excellence um, section, we ask for project objectives. Again, not just project objectives, but also smart project objectives and project objectives that are in line with the NAP challenges, sustainability, beauty and inclusivity. Then we ask for social demand and context. Um, outlining at least two target groups. We ask for uh, then the solution method um, and your project. Um, and finally, we ask for the integration of the three net values again from um, the challenge definition to the proposed solution and um, about gender and diversity. So here in the next section, um, in this impact section, uh, we're asking for performance metrics, so both qualitative and quantitative. Um, and this is often one of the common pitfalls. We ask you to provide performance metrics for the three, three, um, three core values. Very important. Um, now quickly running through, we ask for an alignment with the local strategy, the dissemination and end user engagement plan, the replicability of the project and the future durability potential. Again, please um, highlight the, the different elements of the evaluation criteria so you can ensure um, the highest scoring as possible. Finally, we have the implementation section, which revolves more around kind of practical project management elements of your project. Um, it includes uh, the project management structures, a risk and mitigation plan, uh, the work plan and budget, and finally, uh, team competencies. So shortly, Ellen will run you through um, a bit more practical tips and tricks to improve your proposal writing skills. Uh, we're here to support you through the process. Um, I pass the floor back to you, anne -Laure. Yes, just finishing the process, actually, so you understand after the quality evaluation that it assessed and presented by Rebecca and assessed by external experts, uh, we're going to select to eight projects uh, within this uh, 45k uh, budget, but of course, providing that they have a score uh, of at least 45 points, which is a threshold. So we've, we've gone through it, we look into that, and the expert will also go through some conditions in order to improve your proposal and to be finally uh, funded. So this is the conditions clearing phase. And actually, after that, maybe Rebecca, you can move on on the, on the final slide. The final selection and the onboarding contracting, whenever your conditions are fulfilled, the onboarding and contracting can begin and the project can start on the 1st of February. This will be done by each, in, each individual partner. So each individual partner will actually sign a contract and it will be validated by your services before starting the project. Thank you very much. Uh, Ellen is on you now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anne Laura. And now is Ellen Gale is going to give us short tips and tricks on how to write a successful proposal. Floor is yours. 
Thanks, Maria. Um, this will be very similar to the information that was given in the Connect info session last week. So if you did already attend that, feel free to go and grab a coffee or stand up from your desk for a minute. Um, but I will quickly run through some tips and tricks that we've heard predominantly based on past experience of where projects have been particularly successful or some of the common pitfalls that we've seen. Um, so I'll start with the basics because I think it's all about getting the fundamentals right. And I can't express enough how significant the first point is. We strongly suggest that you keep it simple, explicit and tangible. And fundamentally, this comes down to ensuring that you're actually answering the question um, that's being asked and that you're not relying on the evaluator making assumptions about your project, your organisation or your past experience. Um, fund we can only evaluate what is written on the page. We can't click through links. We can't base it on an image. Um, so it's important that you write down anything that you think we need to know. Um, and here I've written an example of how you can make sure that you're answering the actual question. So if the question asks you to target two social groups, it's important that you one. Oh, the slides have just disappeared for me. Um, I will keep going while they appear. Um, so if the question asks you for two target groups, it's important that you list both two target groups and um, that they are specific. So, for example. Oh, I can see them coming. <laughs> Uh, off the top of my head, one was the project will target local citizens and business minded individuals. Importantly there, if you say local citizens, that's an incredibly broad category and it's not clear to the evaluator who it is that you're actually targeting. It doesn't give us confidence that you're familiar with your target group or the community that you're trying to engage. And similarly, business minded individuals could be anyone from students to entrepreneurs to actual business owners. Whereas a more concrete example of this would be this project will target the local 65 plus population population and school children from three identified schools in the district. This is purely an example, but it is worth thinking about is what you're saying on the page clear to the evaluator of what it is that you are trying to achieve and the target audience that you're providing. Similarly, if the question asks for metrics, it's important that you actually provide metrics. So instead of saying um, we will evaluate the success of this project based on surveys, a more a better response to that would be we will uh, we will evaluate the response based on surveys with a success rate of 60% of respondents evaluated the change to public space positively. So just think about how you can be specific in your answers. Um, and I've got here a few questions that I suggest you ask yourself as you're going through. Um, importantly, have you answered all of the questions, even the optional ones? Um, there is, for example, a question on financial sustainability. It is technically optional, but if you choose to leave it fully blank, you are automatically losing the possibility of accessing five points. Um, so it's worth bearing that in mind as you go ahead. Have you copied and pasted the same answer anywhere? If you're working offline on a Word document, it's very easy to make that mistake because you're copying it in. So please do double check. We've seen this before. Um, and then the next one comes back to Rebecca's point of making sure that you're cross-referencing each question with the core manual and corresponding evaluation criteria. That keeps it as direct as possible and it makes it easier for yourselves to build your answers and easier for us as evaluators to understand make sure that we're evaluating based on the correct uh, criteria and I also suggest that you signpost this so if it if the question asks you about social demand you can be as clear as saying the social demand for this project stems from x and y and um, that makes it straightforward for everyone involved um, have you used AI to help you write your proposal I don't ask this as a negative or a positive thing many proposals do however if you do use AI we highly encourage that you amend it with a human touch afterwards because it is very obvious to us if you don't and that doesn't come across as well in the evaluation there are there are mistakes and it sometimes comes across as less community focused for example um, and lastly longer does not necessarily equal better we're not looking for essays we're looking for specific and concrete answers to the questions that are being posed in front of you and next slide, please. Um, so here we talk a bit about incorporating the new European Bauhaus. And here I would actually encourage you to do this stage before you get in the proposal writing. And from today, we've seen that for many of you, this will be the first time you work on a NEB project, for example. So as you're developing your project and coming up with the idea, familiarize yourself as far as possible with the NEB initiative, the values, and think about whether all three of those values are being manifested in your project in one way or another. Um, they don't necessarily have to be given e equal weight, but it is very obvious to an evaluator if one of them feels like an add-on and that will, that will result in your proposal scoring more poorly. Um, so for example, 
a mobility project which has a strong focus on inclusion, but where aesthetics are addressed through the addition of a few plants. If an evaluator reads that, for example, they're not going to be particularly impressed by the uh, like final sentence where it says, we will add a couple of plants. Um, so I think this should come in your proposal development stage rather than your proposal writing stage and therefore it should be then we woven into the narrative throughout um next slide please and lastly once you've got the basics down and you've incorporated the new European Bauhaus just consider how you can pull it all together into a cohesive narrative so do a full read through make sure that you don't have one answer that is contradicting another answer for example and that it's clear to the evaluator where the project starts how it's progressing and how you get to the end um, in terms of level of ambition, I would suggest aim for ambitious in ideas, but pragmatic in delivery. If you are incredibly ambitious in your proposal, you will only make your life harder at project delivery stage. Um, and we may look at that as evaluators and review whether that is uh, feasible and whether you've given correct thought to the feasibility of your project um, during delivery. And lastly, can you demonstrate that you've considered the impact and legacy of the project? Ideally, these projects have a longer life cycle and an impact on the community. And that really jumps off the page and will be a strong added value to your project if you can demonstrate that in your proposal. And as final checks, if you have time, please do try to get a second pair of eyes to review it. For typo, sometimes you stare at a screen for so long that things blur into one but also to make sure that you haven't missed anything or contradicted yourself and that it's clear as a um as a cohesive structure effectively um those are some those are some practical tips hopefully they're helpful if you do have any specific questions as you're looking through any of the documents i you don't understand what a um one of the evaluation criteria is asking please do reach out to the team email addresses i think either have been shared or will be shared um we're very happy to answer those questions and best of luck for proposal writing thanks so much ellen that has been really useful um so we're going to answer some of the questions, no worries, but uh, now it's a quick answer for us. Uh, so do you think you will be applying? Are you encouraged after this session? Please let us know in Slido. Uh, meanwhile, I have a question on, uh, well, <laughs> of course, there is a matchmaking session on the 10th of September. Uh, at 11 and this is a session that we uh, give the floor to those entities who would like to pitch around just three four minutes about what do they do what would they like in a consortia what are what skills are they missing so by pitching there you might find the partner that you're missing and this is the 10th of September. Please register today or uh, until I think a week before you have time to do so. Uh, and then you'd have a month because the call closes 10th of October to deliver your proposal. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Just quickly to summarize uh, the poll here, we have um, many people that are interested. 40% um, are interested but still need to develop uh, the idea and a consortia. 20% uh, think that their project is a good match but need to find project partners. So this matchmaking session will be uh, the perfect opportunity for you to find potential partners um, to collaborate with for a proposal. Oh, sorry, Rebecca, we missed you. I don't know oh, if no, you just, mute yourself. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Just, just reiterating that um, it seems we have a lot of good potential projects um, and potential matches with our call, um, but many that need to still kind of develop and find partners to work with. So this matchmaking session would be a perfect opportunity um, for many of the attendees here to be able to find um, potential partners and collaborators to uh, submit a proposal. OK, thanks so much, Rebecca. I'm going to ask answer a couple of questions here. Uh, one was directed uh, specifically to me if the project if the project envisage uh, reinvestment. So um, we have uh, enhanced NEP calls um, 
that uh, usually uh, tap or offer uh, the possibility to those uh, successful projects through Connect and Co-Create that uh, had been delivered in the past two years. They offer the possibility to um, replicate or scale up um, elsewhere. So that is uh, our option to continue. Um, yeah, and then there is another question uh, regarding if um, if a project had already started or had received funds, can it be uh, also applying to this call? So um, if you had already started a project, you can build uh, upon that project to um, to write a, a second proposal, a different uh, proposal that could be complementary to the one that you're using. What it's not allowed is that uh, you have exactly one one project, one proposal that uh, gets uh, funding from two different uh, EU institutions to do the same. I hope now it's clear. And the co-funding uh, needs to be brought by the partners of uh, this the consortia that you're gonna build. Okay, uh, I don't know uh, which other uh, questions should we ask now. Uh, answer now. Do we have? Um... No, I think I I think just to complement because there is um sorry for the wrong information on the chat. So actually, there is no possibility to upload any other documents or supporting letter or letter of intent from from the consortium. The 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 design the um, the requirement is actually a declaration of affiliation just in case. The city or the region is not participating, but an affiliated entity to this city or this region is participating in the project. So we need to understand there is this link between the two entities and implicitly they will actually uh, run, be able to run the project in that city or uh, that specific region. So uh, in this so case, the affiliation no letter, letter, it's only to say that the affiliated entity is affiliated to the city or region by and specify the legal link that they are between the two of them. So then we know that they are really affiliated. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Um, I think there's one question worth answering on what exactly the matchmaking session um, will look okay. like. Yeah. Um, yeah. As I mentioned, it's we give the floor to anyone who's registered. When you uh, register through these um, uh, Google Forms, uh, they will ask you if you want to attend, and if you want, or if you want to attend and pitch. So, if you want to attend, you can be there just as a visitor to listen. Uh, and as, again, you can take a note of whoever is presenting there that it may be in your interest. And if you want to pitch, you will be given a template to pitch uh, your entity, your idea, and what are you lacking? What are you looking into a consortium? So that's why you're pitching to find somebody else uh, to complement your skills. And that is that is basically it. I don't know, Rebecca, if you envisage uh, anything else there. No, this is more or less it. We will have um, a little bit of insight. Um, the, the microphone. We'll yeah. have, <laughs> got it. So we'll have a little bit of previous insight into um, what each partner is looking for and maybe do a little bit of pre-work in terms of uh, matchmaking, but the format will, will uh, more or less look like that, Maria. If we have time for a couple more questions, I think one that got maybe a bit uh, muddled in the answers in the chat was around whether we need a declaration from the public entity that they will assign a specific site for the purpose of the project. And uh, no, we don't ask that. But however, uh, but we ensure that the, um, that the city is on board in the project by being part uh, of the consortium. So by the fact of registering, providing all the information that uh, you need to uh, make them into uh, our um, uh, NetSuite platform, we already take for granted that they are informed uh, <laughs> what you intend to do in there. And also uh, in your uh, application, you have to be as specific as Ellen said, as specific as possible. And of course, then we see them in there, so we are already taking for granted that they are uh, well informed of what you're intending to do. 
you can also obviously make reference of uh, the plans that the city have for uh, th those spaces and how are how is the proposal helping to achieve those plans. That's what uh, I presented as potential uh, outcomes. So you make reference of uh, local strategy. So there is different ways that uh, you we cross check that the the city is is there really present. Okay, any other um, you have in mind, Ellen? Thanks for checking. There are so many. We keep answering as much as we can, but we may be losing, missing one. Uh, after today, we will uh, check the, the Q&A chat uh, to make sure we have answered them all. We're going to publish a Q&A in our website together with the slides and recording so you can have access to it. And if if so, after a few days, you, 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 you think that your question is unanswered or you have any other question, uh, you can uh, reach out uh, to us. Yeah. OK. So I think we can we can close here uh, pretty much on time. Um, thanks so much uh, for attending today. Uh, please register for the match uh, making session just as even to 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 be curious about who who is uh, interested in it. You can even make contacts uh, beyond this call. Why not uh, use it as a platform to to extend your network? Thanks so much.